Hey, it's Hardcore Sustainable, and today I'm going to talk to you about The Big Old Garden Book, uh, copyright 1908. I don't really know why it's called The Big Old Garden Book. I assume that's somebody's name. I thought it was a British name, but it's actually published in Philadelphia. Big Old Garden Book. Vegetables, small fruits, and flowers for pleasure and profit by, oh, there it is, Jacob Bigel. A good garden saves doctor bills, drives away the blues, sweetens up the home, and puts money in thy purse. Today, I wanted to go through five of the best tips that I could find in this Big Old Garden book. There's a lot of good tips in it. Uh, you wouldn't think so, though, because published in 1908, it's kind of before a lot of gardening and farming technology came about. But actually, I think there can be some positives to that in that it was written way before the Green Revolution and the advent of chemical agriculture and hybrid seeds. So there's some great suggestions in here from the old timey way of gardening. There's also some pretty scary stuff in it, and I'll get to that in another video that will be about the five scary things from the Big Old Garden book that I would not recommend that you do. So if you don't know what the Green Revolution was, it was a series of advances in agricultural technology, and it happened about from 1950, like post-World War II, uh, through the 70s. And Basically, this was the development of new forms of chemical fertilizer, pesticides, also um, plant breeding technology in the form of hybrids. Wikipedia says about the Green Revolution, cereal production more than doubled in developing nations between the years 1961 and 1985. Yields of rice, maize, which is corn, and wheat increased steadily during that period. The production increases can be attributed roughly equally to irrigation, fertilizer, and seed development. In the late 1800s and early 1900s, there were doubts as to whether current agricultural technology could produce enough yield of crops to feed the booming human population. And the Green Revolution was credited with saving billions of people from starvation. But in reality, what it ended up doing was making it possible for billions more humans to be added to the population of the planet. Had there been limits on the human population, we wouldn't have close to 8 billion people living right now. And those 8 billion people wouldn't be having such a devastating effect on the planet. So a lot of this praise that was heaped on the Green Revolution for feeding the teeming masses of humans was undeserved. In a lot of poor countries, what ended up happening was that subsistence farmers abandoned their local crops and started growing export crops. That meant they had to invest in machinery, they had to invest in chemicals and pesticides and all this input in order to be able to grow food. And then they lost their connection to their local crops, stopped saving those seeds, and those varieties were lost forever. So they found themselves stuck in a situation where instead of just growing their own food, they were growing export crops to make money and then they had to buy food. Also from Wikipedia, while agricultural output increased as a result of the Green Revolution, the energy input to produce a crop has increased faster so that the ratio of crops produced to energy input has increased over time. Green Revolution techniques also rely heavily on agricultural machinery and chemical fertilizers, pesticides, herbicides, and defoliants, which as of 2014 rely on or are derived from crude oil. I like to think of the increase in human population as basically the conversion of fossil fuel directly into human mass and human population. So basically, we are all made of fossil fuel thanks to the Green Revolution. So back to the Big Old Garden Book, which was written over 40 years before the Green Revolution began. So there's no chemical fertilizers, there's definitely chemical pesticides, and all of the seed production was open pollinated. It had been selected by humans, uh, artificially selected over thousands of years, but never had there been the development of these hybrid crops. It's interesting to look at this book and try to figure out who it was written for. In the very beginning, uh, vegetables, small fruits, and flowers for pleasure and profit. So definitely not only for the hobbyists, but for the people trying to make a little bit of money. But nevertheless, an interesting old book, and I've got five tips from it that I'm going to talk about. So the first good idea from the Big Old Garden book is uh, 
something called a hotbed, and you've probably heard the term hotbed of whatever it is. I don't know if that's related at all to this piece of technology, but um, if you've ever heard of a cold frame, I've got one right behind my house that I use to get seedlings going early in the spring. It's kind of like a mini greenhouse, and it's just made with an old storm door, basically just a window that's sort of sloped towards the sun and the south, and so it collects the sun's energy early in the season and it stays much hotter in there than it otherwise would if, you know, if the plants were outside. And this time, in the early 1900s and I think late 1800s as well, there were these glass houses in cities and market gardeners would grow all sorts of produce in the city for sale to people in the city. And one of these technologies that they used was a hotbed, which was like a cold frame, but you dug out the ground underneath it about two feet deep, actually maybe two and a half feet deep, um, and then you put a, about two feet of pure hot fresh manure in the bottom of that bed, and then you put soil over the top, maybe like six inches of soil, and then you plant your greens in that. And now the manure was not being used in the bed uh, as fertilizer necessarily because it's pretty hot, but it's exothermic, so it's giving off heat so it will keep that soil warm, much warmer than it would otherwise be. And also if you have the cold frame or the glass top, it's gonna to contain that heat and then it creates this microclimate so that you can get a much better yield off of these plants early in the season. And uh, so that's what this hotbed is. And so they talk about that in here as a great idea. Idea number two from the Bagel Garden book, dibbers, etc., for transplanting. The transplanting tool used by many gardeners is a short pointed stick called a dibber or dibble and having a handle of any convenient shape. So I don't know if any of you are familiar with a dibber, but I've used them for planting trees or something similar. It's kind of like a dibbler on a stick, a lawn stick for planting trees and basically just move the soil to the side with it and you drop the tree in there. This is kind of similar, uh, only it's used just in your garden bed when you're doing transplants. And I don't usually do that. I usually work up the bed and then I kind of move the soil to the side. But I think if I didn't want to work up the bed and I was just doing some kind of like sheet mulching and wasn't planning on preparing the bed, this might be a good thing to just sort of stick in the ground. You drop your little seedling in and then you use the dibber to uh, loosen the soil and, and tighten it around the plant itself. So I'm going to give it a try. You can easily make one just out of a piece of wood or a stick. So this next thing from the Bigel Garden book isn't necessarily a tip, but it's a good idea, and it's cover crops. I was kind of surprised to hear the Bigel Garden book talking about cover crops. They did mention them as being useful for, you know, keeping down erosion over the winter, um, just to cover the land and protect the soil, but they also mentioned the value of leguminous crops. So things like clovers, alfalfa, beans, peas, and their role in adding nutrients to the soil. And specifically, they did mention these nodules that we know now to be an association between a bacteria and the plant itself, and they create these little colonies that attach to the roots. 70% of our atmosphere is nitrogen, and so these bacteria are able to take nitrogen out of the air and put it into a soluble form that the plant can use. And then, uh, when that crop is tilled into the soil, there's remnants of that nitrogen left over for the following crop. And humans have known that if you planted a crop of grain after planting a leguminous crop like a bean, that it improved the soil and the yield of that grain crop. So they knew that something was happening, but they didn't necessarily know the mechanism. And when the Big Old Garden book was published in 1908, um, it had only been seven years since this bacterial association with the plant root had been discovered. But in the book, they don't mention uh, bacteria as being the cause of the nitrogen and the uh, soil nutrients, but they do mention the nodules as having a role in adding that nutrient to the soil. It's just kind of, kind of fascinating to think of like what technology they had back then and what they knew. And they actually knew a surprising amount back then. Okay, tip number four, and this is sort of in the pesticide section, and I was surprised to find out that they knew about plant pesticides. Um, 
One is white hellebore, which is just, I think, a wild plant. I don't, I know we have a hellebore that grows um, on this continent. I think it might be just a European thing, but obviously they must have had it in Philadelphia because they mentioned it here. It says, this if fresh may be used instead of Paris green in some cases. Paris green was like a chemical, fertile, uh, chemical pesticide, not necessarily a good one. Um, worms on currant and gooseberry bushes, for instance. It is not such a powerful poison as the arsenites and would not do so well for tough in insects such as potato bugs. Dissolve one ounce in three gallons of water and use as a spray. I don't know how you dissolve white hellebore. But anyways, uh, that's a, a plant-based pesticide. They also mentioned tobacco tea as another one. Um, so basically making like a compost tea only using tobacco and then you use that and you spray it on plants. It says good for lice on peas, roses, etc. And then something called buhach. This is known as pyrethrum and pyrethrum is a pretty well-known organic insecticide. It does kill a lot of things like it does kill bees but it's kind of interesting that they knew about it back then um, and I think you could buy it um, it says it may be used as a dry powder dusted on with powder bellows when plants are wet. So the fifth and final tip from the Biggle Garden book um, has to do with onions. And although I've done this kind of myself, I usually like to plant onions from seed. I don't usually buy sets because the set seeds that I can find are all like pretty bad varieties. They're either the sort of sweet Vidalia type of onions or there's some like single storage variety that's kind of generic and not necessarily suited to our conditions here. And they usually do fairly well, but lately I've been trying to grow my own sets. And also I've had a lot of difficulty starting seeds in flats in the spring because they tend to get uh, damping off disease and then they just whole flats of them will die. So I've started planting uh, my seeds outdoors or in the hoop house to get a jump on the season, but directly in the ground. The seedlings get grow going really well just in the soil, direct seeding, and then you can easily dig them up and transplant them. And that's what I did this year, but because I get even the smallest packet of onion seeds, there's a lot of them. And there's way more than I'm gonna be planting in a garden. Because onion seed only lasts about a, a year, it doesn't have a long viability. And so in order to make use of the seeds that I have, I don't want to keep them to the following year. So I just plant the whole bunch of them. And you know, I don't want to keep the seeds for like a, until next year because they only last a year, they're going to be no good or the germination is going to be really low by next year. So what I've been doing is just planting the whole lot, I'm direct seeding it in the soil. And then I get all these plants, I dig up the ones that I want to transplant into beds for larger onions, and then I leave the rest of them just crowded there in this nursery bed. And that's what this book suggests. It says, in early April, the onion seed is sown in rows one foot apart. It grows until the middle of July when the entire crop is gathered. The stalks are then about a foot high, and the onions are about as large around as a penny. Some have grown faster than others. These are called picklers and may be found in grocery stores bottle for table use. After these primes or pickles, picklers have been sorted out, the culls or very small onions sets are placed in large trays and remain there until perfectly dry. So these are the ones that they're leaving until the following year. The great thing about making your own sets, and I have a video about this, is you can get a jump on the next season. And if you're growing your own seed, you can get any variety that you want to grow and turn it into sets. And I've got some Italian varieties, heirloom varieties that I've turned into sets this season. The next year it says, the sets that were planted first as seeds more than a year ago have by July 4th developed into good size onions and men go down the rows with diggers which throw the onions out and then they're piled up and are ready for the toppers. Toppers go on and they cut the roots and stalks off, but then they also leave a bunch of these onions in the ground and they let them produce seed. And so they're saving seed and that's what they talk about in here. It's just really interesting. You know, this was back when people were um, doing it self-sufficiently. They're doing it all for themselves. And so they, they couldn't necessarily go to a seed company. This is when most people save their own seeds and you're producing it year to year and then you're growing your own sets as well. I love that they're suggesting these really old methods. And 
you know, they have all different kinds of onions too. I think they talk about like potato onions and then the bunching onions and different options for, uh, I think they might even mention the walking onions as well, but they knew about all this stuff. And it's just, it's just brilliant, you know, the way that people used to garden way back when. Okay, so that's the Biggle Garden Book, and I don't know if you'll be able to find this. I don't know how rare it is, but sometimes you can find these old books at uh, book sales or bookstores, and they're just always really interesting. I'm learning about the way that people used to do things. Many of the tips are just really great, and things that have been lost in the sands of time. Um, Banjo is bugging me to go for a walk right now, so I better get going. But hope you liked this little video about my five favorite tips from the Biggle Garden book. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel if you haven't done that yet, and share and give a thumbs up to the video, and I'll see you next time.